All right, let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you to God for uh, how you speak to our hearts. Even when we're sleeping, God, you speak to our hearts and you minister to us, dear God, down in our spirit. And I ask you, God, that you will prepare our hearts for the word on today. Forgive us of our sins and anything, dear God, we've said or done is not like you. I pray, God, that you will word my mouth and give me what to say and how to say it. And I ask you, God, that you will bless your people everywhere. They're going through situations. I look upon Haiti right now, God. The people are suffering in Haiti and in Florida and the Bahamas and Cuba. Everywhere that storm is touched, dear God, I ask that you will strengthen and bless your people and just watch over them and help their families uh, just deal with the grief and the loss of life. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Uh, we're going to go ahead and be coming from um, James chapter 5 today. James chapter 5. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, something that when you, if you were to say this 20 years ago, you get a different response. Uh, if you were to ask somebody 20 or 30 years ago, uh, do you have a virus? They would think you had a physical illness. But nowadays, when you hear that term virus, you think about computers. Because uh, a lot of times what happens with computers is uh, somebody will introduce a virus to your computer, it'll, de it'll destroy your computer. And uh, what happens a lot of times with a virus is it masquerades as a good program where it masquerades as something is right, but once it gets inside of your computer, it destroys it or it steals information that it shouldn't have. And so if I was going to put a title on today's message, it would be, What is Your Virus? What is Your Virus? We're in James chapter 5, starting in verse 7. It says, Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets... Uh, the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Uh, as an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and merciful. But above all, my brethren, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or with any other oath, but as your yes is to be yes and your no, no, so that you may not fall under judgment. Verse 13, is anyone among you suffering? Then, let, then he must pray. Is anyone cheerful? He is to sing praises. Verse 14, is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church, and they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer uh, offered in faith will restore the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. If he has committed sins, they will be forgiven. Verse 16 is where we'll stop. Therefore, confess your sins one to another, and pray one for another, that you may be healed. The effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, you know, I'm relating this, this, this message to a virus. And, you know, from the old days when we were growing up, a virus was like the flu, uh, you know, polio, some, some, something that got inside of you that messed you up. Well, from a modern standpoint, when you hear the term virus, you think about a computer. I remember the first time I ever got a virus on a computer, I had to take it to the computer stop store and they kept it for like two weeks. And uh, the guy was explaining to me how there's certain websites that uh, will pop up and it'll, it'll seem like a seemingly harmless website, but when you click on it, it introduces a virus. So when I went back to get my computer, they fixed it, cleaned it all up, but he showed me a list of all of the websites, right, that I had checked on. So the guy was saying, he, and he said, this is the one right here. It seemed like it was a, a, a bank uh, a loan website, but somehow you must have accidentally clicked on it and introduced a, a virus. 
Well, that's how the enemy works with us. A lot of times we're running into situations or running into people in our lives that seem like they're okay or they're harmless or you run into a situation that seems like it's all right, but really it means you harm. It is especially like that sometimes when you run into people. You may run into somebody and they may even say that they're saved. You know, you may run into somebody and they say they love the Lord too. But the truth be told, everybody that says that they're saved isn't saved. Everybody that says they love the Lord doesn't love the Lord. So that's one of the reasons why as Christians, God gives us a gift, and that gift is called discernment. And sometimes, you know, when you're dealing with other people, you're dealing with situations, you really need to pray and ask God to step up your discernment. Because a lot of times, because we don't ask God to give us the insight or help ask God to give us the 411 or the situation, we get taken by a snare. I remember one time I bought a car. It was a Volvo, and it was about maybe 20 years ago. Um, and I just knew this was a good deal. You know, I went to the used car lot, and the car looked spotless. It was, like, shining. You know, the inside was, was impeccable. It was all nice on the inside, you know. And I'm like, man, this is, you know, this is the car. This is the car. You know, I think I only paid something like $2,200 for it. Well, I should have known right there, nothing $2,200 is going to really be worth a whole lot. But I took it on a test drive. Everything seemed good. Well, it was about maybe six months later. This is before I was a member at Mount Calvary, but I happened to be coming to Mount Calvary that night for a service. And I'm driving down Admiral Wilson Boulevard, and all of a sudden I hear this like, ee, like scraping noise. And I'm like, what the heck is that? So I pull into the, uh, the service station on Admiral Wilson Boulevard, and I'm walking around the car, and I look up under the car, my muffler was sitting on the ground. So I, I had, fortunately I had some duct tape and some coat hangers in the car, and I rigged it so it would stay up. Went to the mechanic the next day, the guy said, I said, so I need a new muffler? He said, no, your muffler's fine. He said, the problem is the bottom of the car is rotted out because evidently this car was in a flood. But it looked like it was, I mean, it, you couldn't tell by the outside because they had a new paint job. It looked good. But on the un underneath, the guy showed me there was rust all around the edges of the car. So it wasn't the, that the muffler was bad. It was that the whole car was rotted out and it couldn't hold the muffler. And see, that's how, that's how when we get introduced to, to, to the enemy, the enemy never comes at us straight ahead. You know, the, the, the devil's smart. He knows that we know that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. The enemy knows that the word of God is the truth. The enemy knows all of this. So the enemy is not stupid enough to come at us straight on. He's going to come at you slick. You know, the enemy is a lot like a pimp. In that when a pimp meets a girl, he tells her how pretty she is. He buys her a dress. You know, he tells her she the finest thing since sliced bread. But ultimately, he gets her to do what he wants to do because he's been deceitful. And, he got, and, and that's, that's the enemy. The enemy comes at us all dressed up, looking nice, looking good, telling you how good you are, how nice you are. And that's how he works. And that's how the virus in our lives are introduced. There's a lot of times when you look at some young people, and you say, how did they end up going astray? And it usually started with one friend. You know, that friend that wanted to invite you to a party. Or that friend that wanted to introduce you to some other friends that weren't no good. But usually, a, a, a way a person gets taken in is that initial friend or person looks fine. You know, I remember a lot of the trouble I got into when I first joined the military because the people I hung out with, they seemed like nice guys. Little did I know that they did drugs, they got high, they stayed drunk, they, you know, before I knew it, I was doing everything that they were doing. Because that virus always gets introduced in a way that seems harmless. I remember about six, seven years ago, I get bit by a tick. And the tick had burned its way up under my skin. So when I went to the doctor, they took the tweezers and they pulled the tick out and they put me on antibiotics for about two weeks. And I said to the doctor, why am I going to antibiotics? He said, just in case. You know, now fortunately, I didn't get Lyme disease. But a lot of people, that tick would be under their skin, and they would never know that they got bit by a tick. And that Lyme disease would work its way in there because that's how the enemy is. The enemy doesn't come at us full front, frontal. He comes at us behind the back door, from the side door. You know, however he comes, it's never right on, right straight on. So looking at these scriptures in James, I look at verse 14, it says, Is anyone among you sick? Then he must call for the elders of the church. 
Whenever you find yourself sick, whether it's a physical illness, whether it's a spiritual illness, you need to get help. When you have a physical illness, you go to the doctor. When you have a spiritual problem or a sin problem, you call for the elders of the church. Now, it's funny because when people look at these scriptures, uh, especially a person that's Catholic, they think, oh, that means go confess your sins to a priest. But that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, is any sick among you call for the elders of the church, that they are to pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall restore the one who is sick. Verse 16 says, therefore confess your sins one to another. It didn't say just to the priest or the clergy. It said one to another. Now that right there, that verse is probably one of the hardest verses in the Bible. Because most human beings, especially church folks, we don't want to confess something to somebody else. We'll tell God, but we don't want to tell nobody else. Now why is that? The reason why that is because we want people to think that we're always nice, always good, don't have a problem, don't need deliverance. But the truth be told, there's times in our life when we do need somebody's help. We do need, you know, it's like I tell guys all the time when I do addiction groups, you can't beat an addiction by yourself. You need help. You need God's help first and foremost, and you need the support of your family, if you have family, and you may even need professional counseling. But when it comes to certain things, you need help. It's like when I took that, that computer to the, 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 uh, to the computer place. I said to the guy, well, how come my, uh, my, my software didn't stop this virus? He said, because what happens is the people that put these viruses and put these things out, they upgrade. And so if you don't upgrade the software, the virus will it'll get to the place where it's, it's stronger than the software. Same thing with a physical virus. You know, every year the flu shot is a different strain because the flu changes every year. And sometimes you get a stronger shot, shot, you know, but you might get a weaker shot. Same thing spiritually. You can never deal, the enemy never comes at you the same way. You know, he may use the same thing that gets you tempted, but he'll come at you a different way because after a while you build up a resistance, just like with that, with that virus drug. Your body builds up a resistance. Same thing with the enemy. There's some things that the enemy will come at me with, it ain't gonna tempt me no more. You know, if the enemy came at me with a case of beer and said, drink that case of beer, that, that's not even a temptation for me no more. You know, 25 years ago, a case of beer was temptation, okay? <laughs> not now. So the enemy's like, huh, what can I do to get him to fall? And that's how they, you know, because the enemy's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. But the enemy has demons. And the demons work through human beings. And a lot of times what happens is not so much that the enemy know, knows the inside of our heart, but he observes us. He observes us. I'll give you an example. If I'm walking down the street and a woman walks by with a miniskirt on and I do this, then guess what I just did? I told the enemy what my weakness is. I told the enemy, I projected to the enemy, and so what the enemy does, the enemy will make sure that I have more distractions like that. And so that's how the devil works. He knows what our weak spots are because he observes it. But that's why the Bible says right here, call for the elders of the church. Confess your faults one to another. One of the things that confession does is this. When you confess your faults and your sins, not only to God, but to other people, what that does is it takes the authority that the devil has over you in that area. All right? It's just like, for example, uh, if, if you go to court, and they're trying to build a case against you. You know, but, but when you get to the courtroom, right, the first thing you say to the judge is, I'm guilty. I did it, Your Honor, and I'm sorry I did it. Nine times out of ten, if you approach the court like that, you'll get, they'll give, give you leniency. But if you try to lie and try to go around the barn and try to get, a, you know, and get a false witness and get all this other stuff in there, when they finally find out that you was lying, the judge will throw the book at you. Well, it's the same thing with us. When we confess that we have a fault, it takes the power of the enemy away. Because the enemy can't use that on you now. Oh, he confessed to God and he asked God to forgive him. And oh, he went to the pastor and he asked for forgiveness. And he went to the saints and he, you know, once you do that, the enemy's like, oh. Well, when you hide something, then the enemy's got you. This is one of the things about the devil. You know, the Bible says that, you know, uh, 
when you try to cover a, a hide a sin, yeah, you really, you can't. Because the Bible says what's done in darkness will always come to light. But when you expose the darkness in your own self, the enemy's like, oh, I can't use that on him now. So right, right there, you just break the back of the enemy by confessing, okay, I got a problem with my mouth. I talk too much. Y'all saints pray for me, all right? And what that does, it does two things. One, once you confess something, that, that the power of the enemy is broken over in that situation. But two, you ask other people to intercede for you. And the more people that are praying for you, the stronger you get. That's why, don't ever get to a place where you feel like you're so strong and so spiritual, you don't need nobody to pray for you. Trust me, when I need prayer, I'll be the first one at the altar. Don't ever feel like that, because all of us at some point in our lives need prayer. We need somebody. In fact, the Bible lets us know we're supposed to intercede one for another. Okay? All right. But in verse 15, we'll go back to it again. It says, and the prayer offered in faith will restore the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. And the reason why you look at that verse and you go, wait a minute. Why has it got sickness and sin in the same verse? And this is the reason why. Not all sickness is caused by sin. Some people believe that and it's not true. Remember there was a man that was born blind and his disciples said, Lord, who sinned, him or his parents? Jesus said, neither. So don't assume that because somebody's sick that they did something to deserve that. No, the Bible says the rain falls on the just as well as the unjust. So a person can be sick and they ain't necessarily did nothing wrong. But it mentions sickness in the same breath as sin. And this is the reason why. Whether it's sickness or whether it's sin, don't be ashamed or afraid to get prayer. You know, a lot of times people are ashamed or afraid to get prayer at the altar because they're like, okay, if I go up there, they're going to know something's wrong. So what? But, but then a lot of that's our fault too because when somebody, say for example, somebody came to church one Sunday morning and confessed that they were, they, they were, they were hooked on drugs or they were, you know, they were drinking or they were fornicating or committing adultery. And they, and they want to confess that in front of the church. The church should be a safe place to do that. But sometimes it's not. Because the Bible says, you with your spirits you restore people in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself. So a person should be able to come to church and say, I messed up. But if, you, if they say that, and then you get on the telephone and start calling everybody and telling them, did you know Deacon so-and-so was an alcoholic? No. That's why a lot of people are, are afraid and ashamed to come to the altar because they, they know that people run their mouths. And it should never be like that. You know, when somebody confesses something, that's between them and God. And if they tell you, keep your mouth shut. Just pray for them. Just pray for them. Because the Bible says a spiritual person will restore somebody in a spirit of meekness. But a lot of times what happens to folks in church, they confess or they, 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 they open up to the, to the Lord, open up to the church. And before you know it, the whole network in the neighborhood, everybody in the neighborhood know. I had a situation one time, this happened years ago. A young man came to church and he was at the altar. And unfortunately, there was like two or three other people standing at the altar with him that were supposed to be helping the pastor at the altar. And the young man admitted that he had a problem with homosexuality. Well, the young man should have been able to ask God for help with that at the altar. Well, you know, before the end of the week, everybody in church knew that the brother was struggling with that because somebody opened up their mouth. The young man never came back to church. See what I'm saying? So we had to be careful. That's why a lot of times when I'm at the altar, I don't really like a whole lot of people at the altar. I like just, you know, because sometimes people don't want to say nothing, but they'll whisper it or whatever. And if you do hear something, Keep your mouth shut. Pray for that person. And don't, you know, spread all over the place, all right? Because sometimes the, the person is wrestling with something. What happens is, this is the other thing about the enemy. It goes back to the virus. When you have a virus on your computer, what it does is it opens up your computer to other viruses. Like if you got a, a, a virus that's going after your bank account statement, you know, and, and, and that means your computer is vulnerable. So then you got that virus, then you got maybe three or four other viruses going after your information on the uh, internet. All right? It's the same thing spiritually. If you have a weakness in one area, the enemy will call for some more devils and say, okay, we got them here. Let's, let's, and let's throw some more stuff at them. And the only thing that breaks that is confession. 
what breaks that is the power of God. What breaks that is admitting to God that you, that you, you need deliverance. If you look at Psalm 51, one of my favorite Psalms, when David committed that sin with Bathsheba and killed her husband, in Psalm 51, David said, Against thee and thee only have I sinned and committed this offense in your sight. Have mercy, O God, Lord, according to your loving kindness and tender mercy. David didn't blame Bathsheba. He didn't blame his circumstances. He said, God, I did this. And God forgave him. Now, according to the law, back in them days, David should have got stoned. He committed murder and adultery. That was a, that was a, a death sentence. But God had mercy on David because David was honest. Now, as long as David tried to cover it up, he had no peace. In fact, if you read Psalm 32 and Psalm 38, David says that. As long as I kept silent, it said my bones waxed old, meaning I felt like I was dying on the inside as long as I didn't confess my sin to you, God. And that's what happens to us. You know, whenever you know you did something wrong and you don't confess, you ain't going to sleep too good. Because the Holy Spirit is like, now you know you need to tell the Lord. <laughs> You know you need to ask for forgiveness. You know you need, and that's the power of the Holy Spirit. But that's good. Can you imagine what it'd be like if the Holy Spirit wasn't talking to us? Oh, we'd be in trouble. We'd be in trouble. We, half of us probably be in jail. But the Holy Spirit keeps us honest. The Holy Spirit won't let you try to hide stuff. Yeah. Something else, too. You ever watch a TV show, a police show, and uh, somebody's getting blackmailed? How do you stop a blackmailer? By telling the truth. Yeah. If somebody comes to you and says, I'm going to blackmail you. And say, okay, I'm going to tell the truth. That ends the blackmail. But as long as you want to try and hide it, you're going to keep paying the blackmailer. Same thing with the devil. As long as you try and hide your sin, you're going to keep giving to the devil. The devil's going to keep pulling at you and keep until he gets you somewhere where you don't want to be. I remember there was a, uh, when I used to be a correction officer, there was a young man that made a bad mistake, one of the inmates was his, one of his friends. He knew the guy. And the guy said, man, could you get me a pack of cigarettes? So he didn't think it was no big deal. It was his friend from the hood. He got the boy a pack of cigarettes. Well, you know what that turned into? Every week he started asking for stuff. And the guy said, I can't, I can't get you, I can't get you. And the guy said, I'll tell on you if you don't. See, you can't make friends with the devil. You can't make friends with the devil. And what ended up happening, the guy lost his job because eventually he brought in something that was worse than cigarettes. And he got in trouble. And he, he, and he got arrested on top of that. So he, here he is, he worked in the jail, and they're taking him out of the jail in handcuffs because he did one favor for the devil. You can't make friends with the devil. The devil, the devil means us no good. And a lot of times, that's how viruses are introduced. It, it looks appealing. It looks like something you want behind it, but behind it, is, and that's how it is with the computer things. You know, it, it might be a summer there, you know, win a million dollars, click here. And you click on it, like, you got a virus. <laughs> we, just, we just killed your computer. And that's what the enemy does. You click on something you ain't supposed to, before you know it, the enemy got you. Ah, you're hooked on pornography. Oh, you're looking at uh, naked women. Oh, you're doing this. Oh, you, I got you. That's how the enemy works. And it starts with something really small. And before you know it, you know, you, you knee deep in sin. So be careful, saints. The question was, what is your virus? What is your, what is your weak spot? We all have them. We all have areas of our life that, that the enemy can take advantage of. The best thing that you can do, one, is acknowledge it. Two, confess it. Three, ask Jesus to give you strength. Ask the Lord to give you strength. If you gossip and talk too much, Lord, control my tongue. If you have a tendency to lie, Lord, help me to be honest. You know, if you're impatient, Lord, help my pain. Whatever you're weak, all of us have weaknesses. But the Bible says that this strength is made perfect in weakness. You know, we all have weakness, but you know what? Give it over to the Lord. He'll help you. He'll give you the strength. He'll give you the power to overcome it. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we give you praise and we thank you for this day. We thank you, dear God, for your loving kindness. And I ask that you would just help us, help us, dear God, to overcome those weaknesses and those areas of our life that have become strongholds, those areas of our life where, where we're in, in bondage. Help us, dear God, to walk in victory and help us to walk in freedom. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen.